Yes, sir. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, we are going to talk about this new language that suddenly you've been um, expected to learn, um, how to understand your pathology, why primary site matters, understanding stage, and then talking a little bit about hormones and functional nets. So the net dictionary. I'm not going to go through all of these words. This isn't you. By the way, these slides will be available afterwards, um, likely on the NorCal Carsonet and probably NetRF websites. Um, but there are a lot of abbreviations, acronyms, brand new terminology, um, and you can we can reference back to some of these things throughout the day. But this will be available for future reference. So what's in a name? So the word carcinoid is often used interchangeably with the word neuroendocrine tumor. Carcinoid actually came first. And it's derived from a German word, carcinoid, um, that was coined by a German pathologist back in the early 1900s and meant cancer-like. So in fact, back in the day, these weren't even thought to be cancers. Um, this pathologist, Dr. Orbendorfer, thought these were small and had multiple foci, were undifferentiated had well-defined borders, had no metastatic potential, and were slow-growing and harmless. And for decades, in fact, uh, close to 100 years, this was perpetuated. And in fact, cancer registrars and hospitals didn't recognize these as being cancers. We now know, in fact, these are cancers. And the word carcinoid is falling out of favor. And we'll talk a little bit about what the new terminology or new preferred terminology is. So there are too many names for describing neuroendocrine tumors. Um, some of these are older. I'll go through them in case you've come across them in the past. We sometimes describe them as carcinoid versus pancreatic, or by how fast they grow, well versus poorly differentiated, or whether they secrete hormones. So functional secrete hormones and non-functional do not or named by the hormone that they actually secrete, like an insulinoma that secretes insulin, or a glucagonoma that secretes glucagon. Um, occasionally, they're also classified by where they originated embryologically, so foregut, midgut, and hindgut. So the foregut includes lungs and stomach. The midgut includes the small intestine, appendix, and the beginning of the large intestine. And the hindgut includes the large intestine and the rectum. So moving on from that, then the um, World Health Organization has their own classification system. What I'm going to focus on, and you can see this has evolved over the, over the years, I'd like you to pay attention to the 2010 classification, which is really what most neuroendocrine experts and pathologists now use. So neuroendocrine tumor is really the preferred terminology. And then we say of what primary site? So neuroendocrine tumor of the pancreas or neuroendocrine tumor of the lung. They fall into three grades, grade one, grade two, and grade three, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. So the name derives from the biology. So people always ask, where did the word neuroendocrine come from? So neuro, because they can be stimulated by nerves, and endocrine, because they can release hormones. Um, a little bit more on net biology. So think back to your high school biology. So there are protein receptors that are on the surface of the cell, and neuroendocrine tumors have a characteristic receptor called a somatostatin receptor, or SSTR for short. That's one of the abbreviations in the dictionary. And um, there are five types of these somatostatin receptors. 80% of neuroendocrine tumors overexpress second, the second type, somatostatin receptor type 2. Octreotide, which we'll talk about as a treatment, um, has a really strong affinity for SSTR2. And then the Octrea scan and the DOTA scan, which we'll also hear about later, also demonstrate presence or detect presence of this second somatostatin receptor. So just remember that there's a protein receptor. I like to think of this, many of my patients have seen me use this analogy, but like a lock and a key. So think of the receptor like the lock and octreotide is like the key, and they, they have this special relationship where they can attach to each other. So just remember that analogy. We'll talk about this later today. 
So in terms of understanding your pathology, this is really one of the first key things to do in terms of net basics. So we talked a little bit about terminology already. There are special stains that the pathologist will use to examine a biopsy or a surgical um, specimen under the microscope. And they, these stains, the two key stains that identify a neuroendocrine tumor are somatostatin, or sorry, synaptophysin and chromogranin A. Um, and then grade really is a reflection of how rapidly dividing we think the cells are. We can determine that, again, by looking at the cells, how they look under the microscope, and by special stains. Two key ways that we determine grade are something called KI67 and mitotic index. Those are both ways of determining how rapidly dividing the cells are. And that helps us put the grade into three buckets, grade one, grade two, and grade three. Grade one and two are thought of as the slower growing or also called well differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. And grade three is a poorly differentiated or faster growing neuroendocrine carcinoma. Um, oh yes, this is a reminder to me. So often, um, you know, we collaborate with many local community oncologists. Many of you have a community oncologist and an academic oncologist. As often as part of our second opinion, um, we encourage a second opinion pathology review. So I would say that there is expertise that is required for reviewing pathology. So that is a, um, a key take home. Um, this is just an example of what the pathologists look at under the microscope. Um, and it's sort of looks just like an abstract picture probably for many of you, but um, the pathologist can tell the difference between these three, between grade one, grade two, and grade three based on these special stains. So now, why does primary site matter? So once upon a time, in fact, in the not too distant past, um, even 10, 15 years ago, we really lumped all neuroendocrine tumors together. We thought they were all very similar, they were treated the same way, they were studied the same way in clinical trials, and it's really just been in the last five to seven years that we've recognized that primary site does indeed matter. Um, so they have different incidence rates, so number of patients diagnosed per year. They have different growth rates. They have um, respond to treatment differently and are also now being studied differently in clinical trials. As an example, one of our first talks is on lung and thymic nets. This is a sort of previously forgotten subtype of neuroendocrine tumors and is now really, there's an emphasis on trying to study that more exclusively. Um, so primary sites. So nets can originate in almost any part of the body. Um, I've listed a few of the common ones. So lung, thymus is an organ that sort of sits up um, in the chest above the lungs. The stomach, pancreas, small intestine. The small intestine is comprised of three parts, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. The appendix, which is attaches kind of right at the junction of the small and the large intestine, and then the colon and the rectum. The small intestine is probably the most common primary site, followed by lung and pancreas and then others. Um, these are just some CT scan pictures of, um, of different primary sites, lung, pancreas, and small intestine. But as part of your primer, I'm going to tell you how to read a CT. So, um, so imagine that these are bread slices through the body. Um, we examine that your head is on this end of the screen and your feet are out here. You're looking up towards the body with the, the sort of the right is on actually your left and the left side of the body is on your right. So it's like looking at someone head on. And on, I think I have a, oops. I don't think I have a, a pointer, but that's okay. So if you look at the lung picture, where the, the green markings are, that's a, that indicates where the mass is in the lungs. The sort of um, darker parts around that represent the normal lung. And similarly for the pancreas, the back is down low. Um, we can see, again, where there's a green marking, evidence of a pancreas mass. And then for the small intestine, I think it's a little bit harder to see. There's another green marking there. But um, we may show some additional pictures of images throughout the day. So just remember that we think of these typically as looking at bread slices through the body. 
Okay, staging. Um, so stage defines the extent of the cancer, where it has gone to, especially at the time of diagnosis. So more importantly, where is it and can it be removed? So stage and grade often get confused. So remember back to the pathology, that's the grade. That's how, how fast dividing are those cancer cells, whereas stage refers to where is the cancer in the body. So we determine that by imaging. So those CT scans that you just saw, we can use MRIs, we can use an Octrea scan, and we can use the new generation Octrea scan, the Gallium 68 Dodatate PET-CT, which we're gonna have a special session on that a little bit later. Um, these again are two pictures. The top image is a picture of a CT scan um, of the liver, the sort of bright circles in the liver, which is the organ on sort of the left side of that picture, indicate cancer spots in the liver. And then the bottom picture is a picture of an octreotide scan, which also shows sort of dark spots um, in the liver that represent cancer spots. So if you remember back to that net biology picture of the, of the sort of lock and key, the somatostatin receptor and the octreotide, the octrea scan gives you a little injection of octreotide it's labeled with a low dose of radiation and hones in on where those somatostatin receptors are and lights up like a light bulb where the cancer spots are in the body. That's what we're seeing on the Actria scan. Okay, another picture. This is the newer generation. Um, you can see the clarity of these images compared to the Actria scan. This is the new Gallium 68 Dodatate PET CT. And this also helps identify with that same lock and key principle where the cancer spots are in the body. Typically, Octrea scan and gallium scans are bright in the well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. So again, staging. Um, we have a classification for staging called the AJCC. It's the American Joint Committee on Cancer. They have developed a staging system for all cancers that have, you may have seen it called the TNM staging. It refers to tumor, node and metastasis. And so that's, that sort of lists these here as an example for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Um, and so stage typically is between one and four. One, two, and three usually are localized, and four indicates that the cancer has spread from where it started. So again, just a reminder, stage does not equal grade. Um, so hormones and functional neuroendocrine tumors. So we, the, there are we sort of split these into two categories. Either a tumor secretes hormones or it doesn't. And functional tumors are those that have, uh, for patients who have symptoms from hormone excess. So carcinoid syndrome is the classic example. Um, about 10% of patients with small intestine neuroendocrine tumors have carcinoid syndrome. It's due to the production of certain proteins, typically a protein called serotonin that can also be measured in the urine as 5-HIAA. Um, it can cause symptoms such as flushing, diarrhea, bronchospasm, and heart valve disease, which we'll also talk about a little bit later. Um, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors can also secrete hormones. They can secrete some other funny hormones such as insulin, gastrin, glucagon, and one called vasointestinal polypeptide, which causes diarrhea. And the symptoms from these are really determined by the hormone that's secreted. So you can imagine that if insulin is secreted, the blood sugar can be low. And then the large majority have non-functional neuroendocrine tumors, so do not secrete hormones. Um, I'll mention just some blood and urine tests along with this topic, just because I think uh, uh, this topic can be very confusing. So hormone markers that are associated with symptoms include the following, so serotonin, insulin, gastrin, I won't list, go through that whole list. But there are other markers that are not associated with symptoms. We use these as a marker like one would PSA for prostate cancer. So it doesn't cause a symptom. Chromogranin, neuron-specific enolase, pancreatic polypeptide, they can be useful to complement imaging. So for example, if it's elevated at the time of diagnosis and you get a surgery or you get a treatment, we would expect it to drop. And so we monitor that as part of your surveillance. 
Um, it can help us assess response to treatment. It is never, these blood markers are never solely used to make a decision. We typically partner that with imaging and how a patient is feeling. So a few parting thoughts before I <clears throat> turn the microphone over to Josh Mailman. So focus on understanding just a few key basics. There's gonna be a lot of information today. Hopefully I've given you a few tools to help understand some of the talks today. Please um, write down questions on your cards. Please feel free, we'll have opportunity for lots of Q&A throughout the day. Um, but these five key things, so I want you to remember a little bit about the nomenclature. So the key is neuroendocrine tumor. Um, pathology, sort of those buckets of grade one, grade two, and grade three, um, that primary site does indeed matter. Um, stage defines the extent of disease. We determine stage with using imaging tools. And then lastly, functional tumors are those that secrete hormones that cause symptoms. So I'm going to leave you with a few, um, a few just thoughts um, and, and hopefully some, some hope. Um, so net incidence is low. You've all been told you have a rare cancer. Um, so incidence means the number diagnosed per year. So that's around five per 100,000. So we like to say you're not quite one in a million. Um, but nets are really not that rare. <clears throat> so interestingly, because many patients, it's a slower growing cancer, many patients live for quite a while with the well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. And so the prevalence is quite high, meaning the number of patients alive at any given time. It actually exceeds that of stomach and pancreas cancer, the, the adenocarcinoma type. So it's actually a much bigger public health problem than I think was previously recognized. Thus, we really need to study and do high quality research and host events and raise awareness. So I think the positive that I want to leave you with is that we've had just a renaissance in research and drug approvals um, over the last few years. So back in the 80s, there was one drug. It was streptozocin. It's an old chemotherapy that's not used very much anymore. Um, and then octreotide was approved in the mid-80s. And then it wasn't until 2011, so a few decades later, that we started having new drugs developed. So we'll talk about many of these today. Everolimus and sunitinib in 2011 for pancreatic nets, lanreotide in 2014, and then in 2016, we've had some other new drug approvals. But um, it has been really a tremendous time. I finished my fellowship in, I can't remember now, 2009. Um, and you know it's been an incredible time to be in the field. And I think a very optimistic time for patients. We've had so many new treatments approved, and I want you to feel hopeful about that today, and we'll talk about a lot of that. So um, I will end on that. <clears throat> um, I'd like to invite up Josh Mailman, who's also going to give you sort of his version of a primer of what patients need to know. So thanks for joining for this first talk today. <clears throat>